Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on minimizing risk in the valuation of unregistered land for infrastructure projects. My name is Keisha Blazer. I work for the International Association of Impact Assessment, and I am going to be hosting today's webinar. We are so excited to have you here today. There are over 700 registrants from over 100 countries. Thank you all for joining us. I will be facilitating the webinar today, as I mentioned, though you'll be mainly hearing from our two presenters, who I will introduce in just a moment. The webinar is being hosted today by the International Association for Impact Assessment, or IAIA. IAIA is the leading global network on best practice for using impact assessment for making better and more informed decisions. If you hear something today in our webinar that you want to share on social media, please feel free to do so. You can see our X, formerly Twitter, handle on the screen at IAIA Network, as well as a hashtag that you could use with what you share, hashtag IAIA Webinar. So before we get started, I want to invite you all to check out our website at IAIA.org to see all that we have to offer there. There are a lot of resources there for you to check out, including recordings on demand from some of our past webinars. Our webinars cover a variety of topics. You see only three on the screen there, human rights and impact assessment. This one is in Spanish and covers the significance of human rights in impact evaluations. Um, there are two modules and that one is available to all. Next up, there's a geo portal of migratory austral geese, which is a webinar covering an online tool to support uh, wind farm projects and austral geese conservation, again, available to all. And then there's also another one available called Enhanced environmentally integrated design. So kind of covering digital approaches and some emerging technologies and how those are being used in IA. Again, available to all, but there are many more available. So I really encourage you to check out our webinar page and see what you find because there are topics on health, biodiversity, resettlement, and many more. I also want to invite you to our website to check out our uh, upcoming annual conference. So IAIA24 is going to be held in Dublin, Ireland, and we are so looking forward to seeing all of you there. The topic for this conference is impact assessment for a just transformation. And the early bird registration is just around the corner, uh, the 24th of January. If you register by that deadline, you earn a nice discount on registration. So be sure to visit our website and get a discount. In addition to webinars, IAIA offer also offers a variety of training. So first we have online training courses, which are the same courses that we hold at our annual conference, but they've been converted to be delivered in an online format. Um, these ones are scheduled Zoom sessions. They usually take place over four sessions uh, with a few hours each. And then we also have our professional development program. Now this is our Foundations of Impact Assessment course, and it is a three-month program um, where you watch videos, you do readings, you work with case studies, but the really unique um, and special part about this course is that you are partnered one-on-one -on -one with a mentor who is an expert in their field, and they are there to guide you and help you. Um, you get to meet with them and do video conferences throughout the course, and they are really just there to be, again, a mentor and a guide, so that way, even though it's a foundational course and you really can be at any level in your impact assessment journey to enjoy it and get a lot out of it, um, you do have someone there to help you if you get stuck. And then finally, we of course have, if you go to our resources tab on our website, you'll see a variety of free and downloadable publications. So whether you want something short and sweet, uh, we have some pretty quick ones there like the IA Fast Tips, but we also have some things that are a bit more involved, um, like our best practice principles and guidelines for success. So do check those out. Um, there are plenty more resources to check out on our website as well. Now, a few pieces of housekeeping before we get started. Yes, we are recording this webinar. We will receive an email with a link uh, to both the recording and the slides for today within a day or two of the webinar. So from IAIA HQ, be looking out for that email. However, I do wanna mention that the slides are available now. So if you go to the, um, clicking into your control panel and going to the handouts tab, you can see that along with the bios for our presenters if you are interested. If you have questions, there will be time for a Q&A at the end of the webinar, but please don't feel like you have to wait until then to ask your question. So at any time as you are listening to our presenters, if something sparks a question or you want to ask about something, go ahead and go to your control panel and open up that questions tab and you can type your question right in there and one of our presenters will either answer it directly in there for you or they'll bring it up during the webinar if we have time. Now, I want to introduce you to our presenters for today. So first, we have Satoshi Ishihara. Satoshi is a social sustainability and social development specialist with 20 years of experience in Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. He has extensive experience in resettlement and livelihood restoration under hydropower, highway, mining, and urban projects. His recent work includes case studies of compulsory acquisition of unregistered and customary lands and stock taking of national SIA systems. 
He is based in Indonesia and advises the government of Indonesia and in several state-owned enterprises on ESG frameworks, corporate environmental and social management systems, and SIA processes, including the development of technical guidelines on SIA. He regularly conducts webinars and workshops, including on FPIC and stakeholder engagement, resettlement and livelihood restoration, and ESG and infrastructure, among other issues. Next up, Ben Elder. Ben is a global leader in valuation, having worked extensively around the globe advising clients, governments, and NGOs on valuation issues. Ben is well qualified for this role as an economics and chartered surveyor with an interest in the interface of the economy and property markets, and is the author of a chapter in the Rutledge Handbook on Sustainable Real Estate. Ben has been a practicing valuer and respected academic, holding senior positions at Nottingham Trent University and the College of Estate Management. Ben is the immediate past chair of IVSC Tangible Assets Board and member of the Standards Board. Ben is also the immediate past chair of Commission 9 Valuation for the International Federation of Surveyors. Ben has recently been working with the team on developing the manual and toolkit on the valuation of unregistered land for UN Habitat and FIG. So with that, Ben and Satoshi, it is over to you. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, Keith, for that so, uh, a great introduction. Hopefully you can all, all hear me. And uh, great to have Satoshi, good friend Satoshi, uh, joining me this morning to uh, try and help me through some of the uh, challenges around the valuation of unregistered land uh, from the delivery perspective. Uh, I'll bring the, um, the, the, the technical side of looking at the uh, process of valuation and what it is and what it's not, and some of the challenges around the uh, um, process of identifying the uh, registration, the risks which are involved in that uh, uh, in, in that process. Um, hopefully, we can. Um, uh, um work through this uh, seminar today um, in, a, in a conversational manner. I'm probably going to present for 15, 20 minutes on some key issues, uh, but even through that process, I'm sure that Satoshi will uh, uh, have some uh, some questions and I'll also like to pick up some clarification from Satoshi as, as we move through. But hopefully again, there'll be some great questions to, towards the end of the uh, seminar that we can uh, pick up and um, uh, deal with. So uh, I now need to just work out how to share the screen the button has um, not appeared, um, I'm afraid, at here, sorry, uh, Kisa, the button's not appeared at my end, I don't know, apologies for that, um, can't screenshot webcams, uh, just sorry to delay things just a moment while we find the button. Uh, they always put these in different places on these uh, on, on these softwares, but I can't see the share key. So can you um, can you help? It's on the very top. Um, not just a language help options. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Apologies. It should be now coming through. Can you see that yet? I can see your screen. I can. I think it's a computer screen. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, and then I can see uh, yes the presentation. Okay. Yes, great stuff. Do it in the presentation okay. mode. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Thanks very much. Apologies, everybody, for that delay. As I say, we'll try and get the buttons in the right place so that we can understand them. Um, so moving uh, uh, swiftly on, um, the, the manual for unregistered land is a project that I've been working on with a number of colleagues uh, and then it's got quite a long history uh, looking at the challenges of perhaps uh, protecting some of the most vulnerable people um, uh, on the planet when they get involved in uh, particularly compulsory acquisition for their land or their buildings or their crops um, and their livelihoods um, uh, to facilitate projects which um, uh, need to be completed for uh, various reasons but uh, maybe social or or, or environmental or, or um, um, the, the the whole economic uh, process which underpins the uh, the livelihood of um, uh, of a nation rather than individuals. And uh, one of the key issues that um, uh, has has been uh, brought forward in this whole debate is the process of understanding 
the uh, international ramifications, the international standards which underpin uh, best practice. Um, because again, perhaps sometimes we end up focusing at the delivery end of uh, a project, which is obviously really, really very important. Uh, but as we, um, uh, we, we, we need to recognize that there is a, the other side to the project, and that's, uh, that's the accounting process, the, the business process, which um, needs to be addressed in, in a, a professional manner so that audit trails through financial projects uh, can be followed and we can actually see the uh, or, or, or use the benchmarks to identify whether projects have been successful or, or less successful. Um, and this diagram here just shows a, a selection of some of the international standards which um, which drive this reporting process. And at the top of that, I've got uh, IFRS's uh, International Financial Reporting Standards. Um, and uh, international financial reporting standards are now law in over 140 countries uh, worldwide and uh, deliver the financial framework for uh, accounting processes. But feeding into those um, international financial reporting standards are the international valuation standards. Um, so the uh, IFRSs are only as good as the information which is um, uh, forwarded into those processes and a lot of those are the valuation processes. But also underpinning the valuation process, uh, we have uh, international property measurement standards. Um, properties are measured differently globally uh, and what the international property measurement standards do is try to bring a consistent approach to uh, the measurement of buildings which then allows the data uh, and the information to flow more freely and easily through the other international standards. Because that's what international standards do, they create a common language for understanding uh, cross borders. Um, international construction measurement standards, those exist to make sure that uh, there's not a waste of time in the, uh, in, in the preparation of construction um, uh, measurement uh, issues of bills of quantities. Uh, and again, those feed through into the international valuation standards and on up into IFRSs. And international land measurement standards. Um, International land measurement standards aren't about measuring land. We've been pretty good at measuring land for a long time. International measurements, uh, land measurement standards are about trying to recognize how land is occupied, what the tenure processes are, and that's why it's important to this discussion. But all of those feed into the international valuation standards, which then flow into the international financial reporting standards, and those all those standards are wrapped up with ethical behaviors. So we need to ensure that the uh, professionals in this process are delivering uh, professional standards uh, to the best of their ability. Um, turning again back to the manual for the valuation of unregistered land, um, one of the uh, big uh, milestones which we achieved in uh, 2022 was for the international valuation standards to recognize that interest might be held in formal or informal registered or unregistered uh, formats. Um, and it's certainly a fairly small change in uh, the international valuation standards um, uh, section 400 paragraph 2.1. Um, but it really was a game changer. Uh, before that, uh, the international standards required a legal right to be uh, identified for the valuation standards to be applied. Um, now, with this change, uh, it, uh, it reads that property interests are normally defined by state or by the law of, a, uh, of an individual uh, jurisdiction and are often regulated um, by national or local legislation. So that's recognizing the formal system. In some instances, legitimate individuals, community and communal or community rights are held uh, in an informal, traditional or un, uh, undocumented or unregistered man, uh, manner. And this opened up the uh, uh, complete uh, uh, international standards in valuation to be applied to the valuation of unregistered land. And this is where we, we first move into this risk mitigation.
mitigation uh, area. Um, by applying the international valuation standards, it creates to values there and develop to see um, uh, it, it, and it creates this consistency in approach by adopting the framework, so that we we can we can see whether the uh, the, the process has been carried out in a, a factual and uh, professional uh, manner. We've already just touched on this on the changes in January 2022, um, which um, moved the focus from uh, urban to being a more inclusive um, uh, process of particularly uh, agricultural land and um, uh, non-urban developments and recognition that value may be held in informal tenures. Uh, because again, um, the registration of land um, is a reasonably recent um, uh, uh, process, um, uh, and uh, it's been estimated that approximately 70% of the uh, land in uh, the world is unregistered. Uh, but that doesn't be say markets don't exist in those uh, areas where land is not registered. Um, uh, they have been those markets of exchange of um, land and uh, uh, crops has been uh, taking place for, 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 for centuries. Um, and uh, the registration may well help and create a more uh, audit trail through the process, uh, but it's not essential to actually have uh, the, the markets. But what's really important is the, the note at the bottom of the slide there, which says valuers are not policy makers. Sometimes valuers are seen as the uh, the answer to all problems, um, but uh, I can assure you that we're not. Um, valuers have the tools to value, but we need to understand what we are valuing. Uh, and that comes out of a conversation with uh, other parties to try to identify what it is that we are valuing. Um, it's very, very dangerous just to send somebody off to do a valuation if they don't know what the parameters are, where the boundaries are, etc. Now, the valuer might well be able to help the policy makers to identify those issues, but that's really an additional service to the valuation. The valuation is about creating uh, the numbers which um, uh, are attributed to uh, particular characteristics of, of the land. Um, so there's there's quite a big gap there sometimes. And Satoshi, I don't know whether you want to jump in and just sort of say anything there about that um, that gap between uh, who holds what information about what um, uh, what's being valued. Uh, it's really quite a challenge in some of the areas I know that you work in. Yeah, uh, no, basically, it's, it's always a challenge to, first of all, you know, identify who are the, the rights holders, stakeholders, and who are may not actually be the legitimate land users who may not really have a recognizable rights. And then, you know, how to how to strike a balance between, you know, the what needs to be done for those who have a legally recognizable rights and who those who have legitimate, uh, I mean, kind of occupancy rights or recognition but not legally recognizable. And this is always a challenge. You know, the standard squatters are rather easier to handle. Of course, it's not easy to handle operationally, but it's a lot more challenges when we have lots of gray areas about, you know, when we cannot really determine clearly what recognizable rights people may have and what legitimate uh, occupancy people may have from the, from the society perspective. It's really quite a challenge. And maybe there's a sort of a pre-step to uh, doing that survey process and sometimes technology can help in that space um, yeah. of the way, capturing what's... Ex by the yeah. way, Ben, so, Toshi, you, want to, uh, you want to make the screen and uh, watch the slideshow mode. People say that the, right. the, the audience can see other slides and other information. So can you make okay. it to the slides? Uh, ben, I if you just go to the slide top... Go to the top of your screen and click on display settings there with the drop down. Uh, me, on the top, uh, on the middle. Uh, display screen, setting. Show screen. Uh, uh, it doesn't seem to have. It's on the PowerPoint. Show... On the PowerPoint screen. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So just go on up. The power. Right yeah. there, the display settings, right uh, there. Display settings, yeah. And then swap Keep presenter view. Yep. Have we got there? 
Yep. Yes. Okay. Good. Apologies. Sorry if uh, uh, that's uh, caused a bit of a problem in the first place. Thanks for pointing that out, Satoshi. Um, if we move on to the international valuation standards, um, this this standard actually produces a process. It it it, it, it sets out the steps of what a IVSC compliant valuation uh, requires. It applies to all assets, so it's not just real estate or land. It applies to business valuations, uh, crops, um, anything that uh, um, uh, needs a valuation. The international valuation standards have the capability of uh, being used to uh, assess those values, and it provides this structured framework within which to create the transparent storytelling of evaluation. A good valuation should tell the story from the beginning to the end and the reader should be able to understand each step that the value has taken in uh, coming to their conclusions. Um, it, it talks about scope of works, having the basis of value, which we'll return to in a moment, the valuation approaches, what data and inputs have been put in, what valuation models have been used, and uh, the documentation and reporting, and then on to particular different characteristics for different um, uh, different asset classes. So uh, real estate, the uh, a, a business, um, or, or other uh, types of, of assets, um, uh, like perhaps even small uh, scale uh, production, um, or, or even fishing, etc. The, the, the manual for um, uh, unregistered land looks at economic concepts. The, it creates um, valuations about identifying trigger points that uh, give an indicative number where a transaction would take place uh, under sets of hypothetical conditions. So what we're doing is creating this framework which is then transferable into all sorts of different circumstances, but it creates that structural uh, integrity so that there is a, a commission and understanding of uh, how the process has been undertaken. And the three main approaches that the um, international valuation standards uh, identify are the market approach, uh, uh, that's looking at comparable evidence, what, what something sold for recently, uh, which is of similar nature. Uh, the income approach, which looks at uh, what income could be generated from the asset, or the cost approach, which is not just the um, how much it would cost to uh, construct what is already in existence. It adds additional criteria about um, trying to identify, you use the cost approach to come to a market value. So you're actually using the cost approach and you've got to then consider whether that is appropriate because could it be built in time for immediate occupation? Uh, so there's a whole raft of uh, challenges around the cost uh, uh, approach. Um, it, we have various uh, concepts that we deal with as valuers, a reasonably efficient operator. So who is the individual uh, who, not, not the best in class, not the worst, but uh, somebody who would be running uh, a, a, an agricultural business, a fishery, in a reasonably efficient uh, way. We look at modern equivalents. What happens when you get a building uh, for example, which is doesn't meet modern building requirements. Um, do you cost the replacement of the uh, the old building, or can we actually talk about what a modern equivalence might uh, might look like? It might be smaller than the original. Um, it, it might be larger, but we do have that concept within our valuation toolkit. Um, uh, and we can look at equivalent benefits. So we haven't necessarily got to take like for like but we can look at uh, um, what might uh, uh, provide equivalent benefits. We then look at um, uh, the Environment and Social Standards 5, and again, I'll pass across to Satoshi, who's the expert in this, uh, in this space, because this looks at replacement value, uh, reinstatement of livelihoods, et cetera. Uh, Satoshi, do you want to just um, pick up a little bit on, on, on that? Yes, so the... The World Bank standard ENS, uh, ESS5, uh, you know, like the previous OP4.12, 
says that compensation for land and non-land assets uh, loss should be at the replacement value. Now, exactly what the replacement value is compared to market value is not exactly clear, but what the definition in the standard says is basically this is the value that allows the replacement of the, 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 the pre-project asset levels and living standards without depreciations. Yeah. So it's not really the replacement of poverty with the poverty. So for the house, we don't really acknowledge the accept the, 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 the uh, depreciations. So that you know, there are lots of poor people being infected under our project. So instead of repressing the, the poverty, we say that the minimum living standard be restored or established after displacement, which is basically the concept of the replacement value, which is a bit different from the market value. And that often causes challenges for us because most of the governments we work with have the, the, the valuation standards at the, you said the compensation should be at the market value rather than replacement value. And the gap often creates some issues. Now we, you know, we, uh, we actually have the second objective under the standard, which is to provide additional support to uh, restore the, the well, essentially this assisted restorer's effort to restore the livelihood. So anything that may not really be captured uh, or, or uh, um, enable the restoration of livelihood can actually be assisted through the second, second street of the additional level support in addition to or separate from the compensation for loss of land and non-land assets. Yeah. Over to you, Ben. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Satoshi. That's, uh, uh, that's again, really helpful. And, and that point about there being a gap between um, market value, which is the basis of value, which is uh, used for the majority of national compensation schemes, uh, and the World Bank policy for livelihood reinstatement is really important. Um, and, and just moving on to that concept of market value, uh, and this is a definition which uh, is taken from the international valuation standards. So market value is an estimated amount for which an asset or liability should exchange on the valuation date between a willing buyer and a willing seller in an arm's length transaction after proper marketing uh, where parties have each acted knowledgeably, prudently, and without compulsion. Now, uh, when you read that, it sets up this set of hypothetical circumstances. Um, and immediately people jump to the conclusion, well, if it's for compulsory purchase, if the land is being taken away for somebody, market value can't exist because one of the parties is at, actually uh, acting, uh, they're being um, uh, compulsory required to remove the land. So what's market value um, uh, got to do with this, this, this transaction? The reason that most governments use market value as the basis for uh, compensation is on the uh, on the counterbalance that uh, you need to be fair to the taxpayer as well. So you've got the people who are being displaced, but then you've also got the other side of the equation, which is somebody's paying for this uh, project. And why should they pay more than the party who are being displaced could achieve in the marketplace if they uh, were deciding to sell? So even though it is a compulsory purchase process, uh, the valuer is um, able to put aside the fact that it's a compulsory acquisition and determine a market value. Um, that market value may then be added to by other elements for disturbance and compensation for loss of livelihood, um, but the, the basis of most compensation schemes is the is the value of the land or the buildings which are being taken and then additions made to it. Um, again, there are a number of items down uh, below that, uh, uh, that statement. Um, uh, so, for example, it may also be possible to estimate the market value of some products that are consumed internally within the community. So what, what happens if the community um, um, uh, create some crops which are um, then just uh, used for communal um, feeding uh, uh, of, of the uh, community. 
um, can can valuers actually estimate some of those the value of those items? Um, yes, they can. Uh, it, it's a uh, it, it is an economic process, and this is where one of the challenges start to uh, come into the uh, into the process is that not everything is valued in a market process, um, but the valuer is able to uh, apply their skills to identify what alternatives might be to um, to the uh, to the to the product and um, come up with a, a a settlement process. But it's really important again that the uh, the valuer is clear about what they are being asked to do, and the valuer can help the um, the client in that space uh, by um, suggesting and agreeing what the instructions are and what they can and what they cannot do. Uh, but it's again that really impress, uh, important uh, process. Moving on the investment value, uh, so there's uh, two main uh, types of um, uh, bases of value. We've got market value uh, and investment value. So when you instruct a valuer, you need to tell them what it is that you need to receive. Uh, so if you were looking for that market value, that's the value that the market would pay for whatever it is that is being uh, being valued. So for the for a house with a garden, uh, the market value is what somebody else would pay for that house. And there must be more than one purchaser at that price. Uh, whereas when we move to investment value, investment value is the value of an asset to a particular owner or a prospective owner. So we've, we've moved from this, this, this idea that there's a market value to investment value, which where we start to look at what uh, an asset is worth to an individual. So we're starting to take into worth rather than value. Uh, and this again is a really important um, element that needs to be uh, taken into account when we are assessing the risk elements of the, uh, of the, of the project. And that's just a di diagrammatic uh, process which looks at what market value is. So particularly where we're talking about unregistered land uh, and property rights, uh, market value would uh, go through the process of identifying unregistered land and the, the rights, collecting land and property information, determining whether a market exists or not, and then quantify market value. So we would be able to look at the risk and the uncertainty uh, associated with the continued enjoyment of the asset by the individual that we are uh, that, that, that has current um, um, ownership. But then when we start to move into investment value, we've got two more squares which we I, I, uh, add on to those. So identification of any non-market values. So are there some items which are of value to the individual or the community? Which are not priced into the um, uh, in, into the market value, and then we need to quantify or recognise non-market values and deal with their risk and uncertainty. So again, how long are those um, uh, benefits likely to uh, retain in the uh, in the process for and uh, stay in the uh, in, in the uh, or, or the current owner to continue to receive those those benefits. And one of the challenges, again, that we'll move on to with Satoshi in a moment, is looking at those non-market values uh, that we um, uh, that we need to uh, look at. Satoshi, do you want to just um, pick up on that and I'll move to the next slide? Yeah, maybe it's interesting to actually hear from you. If you have any, can you move back to the previous slides? Oh, Ben, <laughs> oh, he's just stepped out. You know, what is interesting, so Ben, just move back to the previous slides. Uh, I just want to ask you, which countries recognize investment value as for as part of the compensation, for instance, for compulsory acquisition of properties? For instance, Indonesia does recognize what they call non-physical components of the physical assets, which is essentially the value to the owner. And there are some criteria and components 
that is entitled uh, that is that, that can be can, that can be compensated, but they are not really the market value of the asset per se, but they are divided to the owner, that owner gain from using the that physical assets. I don't know many if any other countries actually recognize such as part of the compensation for physical assets. Do you know any countries? It, it, it's normally captured in the market value. I know it's outside. Though. So, for example, I'll use the UK as an example. Um, we, we, you can claim some compensation for the effect of physical factors. So even if you've had no land taken away from you, uh, if there's a diminution in value because of the scheme which is close by, uh, you can claim comp some compensation for that uh, diminution in value. But it is a diminution of market value. So it's a reduction of market value. It's not a sort of standalone um, recognition that uh, we um, that we have different values for different uh, different items. Um, there is a part in some compensations which will recognise, particularly when a business is involved, uh, that uh, the location of particular site um, in association with each, with each other may generate additional. Um, returns for that business uh, above what might be achieved by um, other parties. Uh, so uh, again, there's a sort of worth which is uh, uh, pushed into that space, but the majority of um, uh, uh, countries uh, fall back to the market value as being the really the only uh, and I've got to get myself into trouble here, Satoshi. The the only true um, uh, element that can be measured consistently, because investment value is the worth to the individual. Market value is what the market would pay for a particular asset. Um, and it's uh, I think it's probably important also to say that uh, the, the valuer might not like what the market is saying and what it's doing, but it's their job to interpret the market, uh, not to make the market. Does that yeah. uh, make any sense? Yeah, just a bit of follow-up question. I think this is an interest to the, a lot of participants here. How, how, how do you actually, you know, estimate or, or measure the value to the owner and how do you ensure the fairness or some objectivity to the valuation that you may do about the value to the owner? Yeah, uh, uh, again, I, I would start with that, that diagram and you can identify the market value. So my initial steps would be to uh, establish the market value. Um, the um, it would then be talking to the uh, to the owner uh, and identifying why uh, they hadn't sold already. Because if the um, if their individual worth falls below market value, then uh, you will you will sell that asset. So. Um, uh, I've lived in my house here for uh, about 40 years. Um, we've raised a family here. Um, we like living here. Uh, we've we've really enjoyed it. We've got some emotional attachment to the uh, to to the house. Um, but my son no longer lives with us. He's he's set up his own home. Uh, so maybe this house is now slightly bigger than we need. Uh, and then you start. So our uh, the building is exactly the same as it was previously. But uh, our assessment of its um, uh, its worth to us uh, has changed, uh, and and when that worth becomes less than market value, that's when we would uh, a sale transaction would would take place. Um, but how do you establish it? You need to uh, have conversations with the um, uh, with with the owners and identify what it is that creates that additional value to them. Is it, is it the location? Is it near family? Is it what, what is it that actually drives that additional value? And then trying to um, uh, place a, a monetary value on that, um, on that additional item. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, you move into is, subjective rather than the objective world. Right. I mean, then comes one question from the participant, which is related to this, and I think is something that many of us interested to hear your views. And so, so how can you distinguish value only to the owner as opposed to the speculators who may come and mention everything have values in their perspective? Which you would need to value then uh, using an investment methods, investment value approach. Yeah, I mean, the, the, we, we, we've got the speculators, but again, most compulsory purchase uh, acquisitions have a scheme behind them. So you have to go through a process to get those compulsory purchase powers um, to deliver a, a project which is of benefit to the. Um, uh, to society as well as the uh, uh, rather than just sort of to to the individual speculation process. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the the that, that that sort of um, protection for the people who are being displaced, I think, is probably where the question's coming from, Satoshi. Uh, how do you uh, protect um, uh, perhaps people from who who occupy land, uh, um, perhaps by a river at the moment, and they use the river for fishing uh, and generating uh, almost a, 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 a poverty line uh, existence? Um, and those people being displaced perhaps by, um, I don't know, a hydroelectric dam or, or, or um, uh, some, some flooding of the area. How, how, how can you assess those, um, the values to those, those individuals? Well, there, there are two calculations which I would um, uh, suggest. One is uh, to, to establish this market value as the benchmark. So how much is the land um, uh, worth in the marketplace, probably without the scheme. So uh, how much would somebody pay for that land at this particular point in time? And it may not be very much. This is one of the challenges because lots of these schemes uh, try to um, uh, you well, they use land that is um, obviously suitable for the project. Um, but this quite often they are in fairly remote areas. Uh, and therefore, because those, the land is away from um, market urban areas, they tend to have a lower value. Um, and therefore, the sort of replacement of that land elsewhere may be really challenging for the amount of money which um, the individual uh, may receive. Because that's the, the principle of the, uh, the whole process is that uh, if, if uh, a claimant gets market value plus a top up for compensation for fees, etc., um, then they should be able to then go and purchase similar um, uh, assets, uh, similar land um, in the reasonable location, uh, reasonably close lo location with the money that they receive. Uh, one of the challenges in that is that sometimes when the schemes take place, the actual value of the land adjoining the scheme also uh, rises in value. Uh, and therefore, sometimes the uh, the, the amount of money and the amount of compensation received um, may not be sufficient to uh, compensate or, or allow that person to buy an alternative uh, equivalent uh, piece of land uh, nearby. Uh, and this is where some of the governments have stepped in and uh, added multipliers to um, market value. Uh, I believe in India they uh, they now uh, apply a multiplier of uh, I think it's 100% increase in um, uh, in rural areas and 200% in urban areas. Please don't take those as gospel. Uh, I'd have to check those uh, those numbers, but that is to compensate the individuals for their investment value. Uh, Satoshi. So you start with the market value and then somebody's decided that a calculation of that sort is uh, a reasonable way of getting to some uh, fair number for compensation. Uh, but it's not the valuer who should be set it, setting those multipliers um, when they're applied in that way. Uh, the valuer can really only advise on the individual asset. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, many countries now adopting this, you know, the multipliers or top up. Indonesia uh, variation standard does have this top up concept to, you know, make sure that people do have uh, the, the comp receive compensation uh, that is sufficient, I mean, minimum sufficient to what they call replacement value. Uh, it's not really replacement value, something else, but something similar concept. Now, the question, okay, then a little bit of ex uh, we, we can move on to the next slide, but one thing I want to ask you is that are you going to use cost approach as you do so? Uh, top up is probably the easier way and more practical operational way, but you may be able to use cost approach because this is one question came from one participant so to ask you elaborate a little bit more what you do for the cost approach. Okay. Um, look at my slides for a moment and then we can pick up and uh, go back if necessary, Satoshi. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the, the cost approach is there to try to, uh, uh, w within a methodology, it's there to try to get to market price, to this trigger price when a transaction would um, uh, would occur. What you're trying to do, and uh, there, there are, this is where typically professional languages start to get confusing because the professions use them in a particular way and they have a very specific meaning. So within the cost approach within the international valuation standards, you are using the cost approach to identify market value normally. So you're looking at what it would cost, keep it simple, you've got a house, how much would it cost to rebuild that house next door? Yeah, um, but then there are additional things. If there was a house re already standing next door that you could buy and it was at a less amount of money than the cost of rebuilding, you would buy next door. And so the cost approach, just because it costs something to build, doesn't equal its value. But the cost approach is then used to say, well, actually, let's look at that the other way around, that if it was going, if you could build a, a house next door cheaper than buy one which is already on the marketplace and it could be ready for occupation within a reasonable time scale, then you build your own. So it's, it, it, all, all the valuation is doing is taking individual and community approaches to very logical, very um, individual decisions. Um, the other question, which um, again, I think we, we, we get into Satoshi with the um, livelihood reinstatement issues is that is really talking about the actual cost. They're using the cost not to try to provide an alternative, not to try and come to market value, but what is the real cost of uh, moving this community from this piece of land to another piece of land? Um, and then you have to ask the question, is the land being provided? So is do, do the individuals have to purchase the land or is the scheme providing the land? Um, so you, you need to sort of get into a detailed inventory of what is being provided and who is going to provide it and then estimating the cost against that, the, the actual cost, what I, would, what I would call a bill of quantities from the uh, uh, f from a cost en engineer, perhaps rather than a valuer. Um, so again, you need to get make sure that you're employing the appropriate professional for the job in in hand at that 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 point. But the real challenge still is this gap between what government policies say about compensation for land which is compulsory acquired, and then this livelihood reinstatement, which is um, a, usually a, a quite often a gap between the two. Uh, and that gap is very often not discovered until uh, the project is quite a long way under um, uh, under construction or, or, or under planning. Uh, and I think that this is one of the most valuable lessons to be uh, learned is actually that identification at very early stages of projects, whether there are any gaps between the understanding of national policies 
particularly around compensation and the funding agent agency, be it the World Bank or whoever, uh, and their requirements. Uh, again, using Indonesia, again, I know that there've been some challenges there uh, because of the uh, the law in Indonesia that if the valuers do anything which is outside of the Act of Parliament, which actually uh, empowers compensation, then they can be sent to prison. So it's not that they don't. So they they have they have to follow the law, um, but they but it's not necessarily. Uh, prohibits getting to the right answer because what they need to do is provide the market value as per the law and then that can be topped up to get to reinstatement value um, uh, which is required by the, the, the funding authorities but, but it, and again this sounds very boring um, but we need to be really careful with these issues Satoshi to make sure that the bookkeeping the accounting is clear and concise about what payments have been made to whom under what headings of compensation because the risk there is enormous and uh, if it's not clear uh, then even if um, the, the, there hasn't been any misdoing um, any corruption unless it's really clear how and why those the numbers have been calculated and how they've been paid um, it, it leaves the project managers open to to question um, and I think probably that touches on one of the other things that we've we've found as well Satoshi is um, actually finding out who should receive those payments so we could we can go through all the detailed assessment processes but then who do we pay the money to in a community um, is it necessarily the, the chief uh, is it is uh, again getting to dangerous water here but sort of the gender issues around whether actually you know it's usually the male who holds the bank account in many countries not the female um, so that all those issues about fairness need to be considered very carefully as you move through the project but I'd reiterate this I, it would be very unwise just to leave those decisions well they shouldn't be left in the hand of the valuer they should be made by the policy makers and then the valuer should provide the information into the the framework for those policy makers to uh, deliver uh, the outcomes required of of the policy and the scheme but but the earlier those can be identified the better yeah ben just so you know yeah uh, we uh we can't see your presentation anymore so you may want to bring it back uh just for now okay. i think we are presentation is just... ending but in, as you do that in the meantime yes you know we have done the international conference on the you know the unregistered land customary land the one thing came out very very strongly is this issue of inter-community inter-households uh distribution or sharing of compensation so you know when you have talk about the registered land and then you may be able to just you know pay compensation to the head of the, the landowners or the title title holders but then the question of who actually use the land and who actually gain from using the land and then the question of particularly the customary land okay the the land may be under the customary ownership of indigenous community for instance but then who should receive what compensation? If compensation be paid to the indigenous authority, then the indigenous authority can can distribute the, 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 the compensation amongst the members and how they're gonna do about it. And then there's lots of questions about the distribution of the of the compensation. You, you know, it's relatively straightforward. I mean, it is not probably from your perspective, but in our practitioner's perspective, it may be relatively easier to put the value, you know, dollar amount of the of the asset. But then the question is how who has the who has the who has the stake in using the assets, land or non land, and then who should have the you know the, the entitlements to how much of the compensation 
how much of the of the value of the of the asset that is shared between different individuals and then it comes the question of you know the the remote members of the community who may only come once in a while and they use the land or you know, the, the natural resources and how much compensation or so this person is entitled for it's it's a complex process Absolutely. And I think, Satoshi, I mean, uh, this is why the sort of the mitigation stage of any planning uh, of any project is so important to try and mitigate the, the, the impact as, as, as much as possible. Uh, and, and if there are um, transient uh, people who, who, who use the, the land occasionally, they may not even use it. They may only use it to get from one point to another. Um, you know what what um, uh, what steps are being put in place to make sure that those migration routes um, are, are, are maintained um, you know is, is it big fences around with with corridors or what, what is it that, that the scheme needs to consider and I, one of the challenges is the detail which is required I remember talking to um, <coughs> Uh, one one group of uh, project managers, and one of the challenges uh, they they were spending enormous amounts of time trying to calculate the um, the income which which an individual could make by carrying um, goods from the farm to the marketplace. So these these uh, uh, individuals walked uh, between five and ten miles to the marketplace and carried either one or two packs per day. Uh, and the the project managers were going into great detail about how uh, how to calculate the value of that business to that individual. Uh, but they were spending very little time. They said they hadn't got the resources to actually do a proper survey of the uh, of, of the land land and building assets, which were being um, part of the scheme, were being taken as part of the scheme. So, in in my estimation to them, they were spending uh, a lot of valuable resource time to calculate small numbers, uh, but ignoring. The bigger numbers, uh, which would have greater impact, uh, and uh, I was trying to suggest politely that uh, perhaps um, the, the the detail they were entering in to um, calculate the back the the, the carrier's wage uh, could have been estimated more generously with little impact on the. Uh, project and the resources relocated to some of the major uh, areas. So, sort of having a uh, a risk matrix uh, and uh, uh, a sensitivity analysis uh, against the various elements of a project um, would probably be a, a pretty good good starting point. Yeah, I think we kind of running out of time, but there are a couple of interesting questions. I put some hypothetical cases as a as a kind of Q and A, but I would rather put uh, you know introduce some of the interesting questions from the participants. Like sometimes okay. we oh. find that landless people are residing on the river bank or in or in between the edges of the river and bridges, which is basically unregistered land. So in that case, how should we consider the valuation of the land parcel? Uh, as per as per which guidelines, rate of schedule of which department, and as in India, land prices are not considered for the landless affected people. Then how 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 do we need to compensate uh, the affected people? Uh, again, re really challenging question there. I mean, I think that the, the again a logical process is you need to understand the law. So what does the law allow you to do in India? Uh, but then you need to understand what the overarching project um, funders requirements are. So if it was the World Bank, they would be looking to compensate these vulnerable people. Uh, and then I, the project manager would be asking the, the valuer to go and estimate the value of the, uh, the use that they are putting the land to. They may not own it, but what would their loss be if they, uh, um, simple example, if they stop catching the fish uh, every day, uh, how much would it cost them to go and buy that fish from the marketplace? Uh, and what would all the incidental costs be? Then the big question is how long would you take that loss for? Is it 
one year's loss, two years loss, 10 years loss. Um, uh, and, and to come to that conclusion as a value, I would be coming to some judgment about the risk of those people being stopped anyway, not, not because of the scheme, but because the landowner suddenly decided actually they could sell fishing rights on that river uh, and therefore they stopped the indigenous population from uh, entering, I'll say illegally, uh, which is always a difficult word to say on those, those issues, but uh, could stop people entering the land for um, for, for those purposes. So what, what would the likelihood of the individual being able to continue their, the benefit of occupation um, or, or, or taking the fish? How, how many years would that likely to be? And, and Interesting. Doing that calculation. Yeah, yeah, thank you. One more question. I don't know how much more time we can have, but this is another interesting question. To what extent can valuation of uninformed livelihood and vulnerable support programs for affected persons, especially the vulnerable persons, bearing in mind that the vulnerability will usually do not, uh, vulner vulnerable people do not usually possess our uh, own high valuable physical assets? Yeah, good, again, uh really challenging question there as you say <coughs> excuse me just in the title um that probably means that they are um uh, you know the vulnerable people won't have a regular income they won't they, they won't have the documentations they probably marginalize perhaps by society in general um uh, and again i would say that that is uh, down to the policy so if the um the funding authority are um require those people to be compensated then you start to need to draw up an inventory of who they are and what rights what 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 not rights what benefits they actually have how do they survive at the moment and um articulating that and it sounds terrible to sort of transfer everything into a balance sheet but sort of moving things you know sort of uh, breaking down their occupation into a daily life of you know what time do they get up in the morning how do they get the food they need at the first feeding point um, do they do any work for local landowners which then get, they get paid for in food and you need to build up that that picture and it's, it's time consuming and expensive uh, and that's probably what I was saying a little bit earlier on at some point Satoshi it might be much more economically viable to turn around and say well actually how much does a typical family need to live in this geographical area and we will give each family that amount rather than trying to work out the individual um, livelihood restoration, um, because that is a, almost a never ending task and can delay projects enormously. So there's, there's almost a common sense process that needs to be built in, but you need to make sure it fits the policy. Because again, if you do that, and then somebody challenges you down the line, uh, at some point, the um, you might find that there's some uh, real difficulties in explaining why and how you've um, reached those decisions. Yeah, that's the big challenge. Uh, I don't know how much more time do we have, two more minutes, or maybe one or two more questions related to what you said. Any challenges in evaluation of community or commons uh, like pasture land? Yeah, I think the question again, is more of its distribution rather than the valuation per se, but tell us a little bit about yeah. the yeah, the valuation. I mean, we we would carry it. Yeah, we carry out the valuation in the same same way uh, as if it was owned by an individual. Well, you know, what what is the market value? What would somebody? We would probably discount it slightly because if you've got lots of owners, uh, it becomes more difficult because the purchaser might turn up and put their herd of sheep on the land. Uh, and then somebody who claims to be part of the community who didn't get some compensation will might well be there trying to 
push those sheep off the field. Um, whereas if you've got one transaction, uh, it's usually clearer and, uh, and cleaner. So there's there's more risk involved in those processes. So there may be a discount because of the because of the fact that it is uh, communal in that in that way. There may be an increase because actually by communal occupation there isn't so much upkeep per uh, per person that the, 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 the you know the fencing and etc is shared in 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 maintenance um, but that's the judgment the valuer has to to make and they will they should be able to explain all those judgment points as they move through uh, the dis distribution as I say I think is really a um, uh, a, a policy issue uh, and really getting that agreement at the beginning uh, is much better so going to the community identifying who the community leaders are but then sense checking that those are the real community leaders um, uh, and and and, and uh, being able to verify that you've made reasonable efforts to establish the community structure that that existed at the point in time yeah i think you know when it comes to commons i think we need to really rely on traditional leaders and community members uh, you know the question is how much you can control some edit capture you know uh questions of the you know the, the customer leaders may not necessarily be transparent uh we have a case example in indonesia where the community kind of kind of community workers, the local villagers so actually in this urban context, but they actually work as a community workers, uh, trained by I mean, former World Bank project to be the community workers. And they actually actively, you know, work, you know, to engage with the villagers and then and talk to the village leaders to make sure that the the the, the true legitimate right holders rights holders identified and how much stake they have get identified so it was more of the uh, collaboration between the project uh, local leaders as well as community members but that's a little time consuming and as you said maybe it's simpler to just to you know identify what may be sufficient to restore people's livelihood and then boom just to, uh, just to use the the, the 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 value that may be easier than trying spending hours and hours identify who has the who has the stake and who has the legitimate rights or occupancy uh, uh socially recognizable and then do the valuation uh, for each one of them yeah. absolutely Satoshi. we've been um prompted by uh, Kisa to uh, uh, wrap this up. But uh, uh, thanks, Satoshi. I've, I've enjoyed the conversation with you as always. Uh, but back to you, Kisa. Alrighty, thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you to Ben and Satoshi for a great presentation. There were a lot of questions that you know were in the Q&A. <clears throat> And I'm sorry we didn't have time to answer all your questions, but what a great presentation. Um, let's keep talking about this. There were a lot of great topics that were brought up today, a lot of great um, pieces that were shared. And so if you see anything that you would like to share um, with your networks online, we invite you to do so. You can see our social media handles and hashtags there. And if you are an IAIA member, I invite you to share something into the hub, which is our online community about the webinar today and what you took away from it. Just a reminder that in a day or two, you'll be receiving an email from IAIAHQ with a link to both the recordings and the slides. And as you leave here today, you'll also be prompted to fill out a survey, and we'd love to get your feedback. There's one question about future topics um, that you'd like to hear discussed in a webinar. So if you have any topics that you'd like to hear about, um, we let us know because we will do the work to find the experts who can bring that information to you. Um, and we just need to know what you wanna hear about. So please do let us know that. And a final thanks to all of you for joining us. We know that your time is really valuable, and so we really appreciate you joining us today, and we hope that you thought it was valuable as well. So everyone have a great day, and we will see you next time. Thank you, everybody, and apologies for the...